I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are back now talking about Reaganomics and what we could learn uh, in the current economic environment. Great to see you all back with our panelists talking about the success of that era. Let me kick it off, gentlemen, with an open question in terms of the success of President Reagan's economics and what we might take from that era to perhaps create solutions to some of the ills that we're seeing during today's slow economic environment. Lewis? Uh, uh, this morning, there was, a, I think, a general consensus that there were at least uh, four principal objectives in Reaganomics, supplies out economics, economic policy reform uh, in the late 70s, which President Reagan implemented. First was getting, uh, getting government spending under control, at least reducing the rate of growth of government spending. The other was deregulation, which, of course, did begin in the Carter administration. The third was a, a, an attempt at budgetary equilibrium over the, over the full business cycle. And then, of course, some method whereby we could restrain the Federal Reserve's increasingly absolute discretion over the creation of credit in the economy. And of course, uh, the most central policy of all, the one that was done most successfully, was tax rate reduction. That, I think, was the consensus this morning. The question is, what was not done in that period, which has permitted um, a runaway, even a rogue government, a renegade government, and a level of government spending that no one in the 80s, given the successes we were achieving, uh, could have anticipated. Why is it that almost every president has come to office, every major economic uh, policy advisor, saying, we are going to control government spending. Uh, we know how to do that. Uh, we are going to reduce tax rates, but also we are going to control government spending. Indeed, we are going to balance the budget. President Reagan himself was most interested in the idea of budgetary equilibrium over the full business cycle. And I think he mentioned not only to me uh, personally, but to others uh, who have served on this panel. And at the very end of his uh, uh, administration, he said he was most disappointed that he was less well, able to get control of the Let me, let me back up here for a second, because something that you just said struck me. And I want to see if our, our other two panelists here agree with that. Now, Larry Lindsay, do you agree that there was something missing in the Reagan era that, in fact, led to this overspending and the situation uh, that we are in today? Well, you know, the problem with Washington is you can have some success, but you can't necessarily hit, hit a home run. And uh, Reagan got us at least to third base. The problem here uh, with spending is that you have uh, constituencies that want it, and the people who pay for it on the other end are very diverse. Uh, and it's hard to get them together in a coalition. And so, in general, the bias in Washington is always going to be to spend more, because you have narrow constituencies who want to vote for it, and opposition to it, you know, we don't even know who pays for spending now. Uh, if, if you do it through debt or if you do it through money creation, it's future generations and they don't even turn up at the ballot box. So um, I think we have a, a natural bias in our system to want to spend and every now and then it takes a movement like what we have uh, in 2010 to come along and start slashing spending. Uh, uh, just a uh, comment on uh, Larry's implying that uh, I think that there was a, a missing link and um, I'm inclined to think that uh, uh, Larry Kudlow also uh, takes that position, knowing him as I do for so very long. The missing link was that we never, we never got control of the Federal Reserve's absolute discretion ah. to create money without limit. And we did not understand, or at least it was not well understood then, that the world dollar standard, which had come to replace convertibility to gold, namely the international gold standard, 
which it was abandoned uh, at the onset of World War I, we didn't understand really what the effects of the world dollar standard meant. That is to say, all countries in the entire world being on the paper dollar standard, accumulating as their official reserves U.S. dollars and converting them promptly in the New York money market into U.S. treasuries. So you had this, you had this sort of two-headed hydra providing limitless credit to the federal government, namely the Federal Reserve, which uh, entire balance sheet was composed of U.S. Treasury securities. Presently, we're accumulating at the rate of 600 billion in a, in a mere eight-month period. And you had foreign official authorities accumulating these dollars and converting them into Treasury securities. But the numbers are staggering now. There's three and a half trillion dollars of U.S. government securities as official reserves in the hands of foreign monetary authorities. At the uh, U.S. Central Bank itself, there's approximately uh, two and a half trillion dollars of Federal Reserve credit, the, uh, the, uh, the largest fraction of which is federal agency securities and U.S. government uh, direct debt, which is, of course, accumulating at an ever faster ratio. Now, any debtor who has unlimited credit facilities at zero interest rate is he not going to take advantage of unlimited credit? And that is the story of the federal government. That is the reason why every well-meaning president of the United States, every well-meaning secretary of the Treasury has said, we will get government spending under control. But why they could not? Because if the Congress is able to finance every one of its spending programs, whether it's wars abroad or welfare spending at home, with, with zero interest credit, or at least the cheapest credit available at the Federal Reserve Bank, they certainly are going to take advantage of it. And that is the problem of the unlimited growth of the federal government, uh, which Larry, is Larry fire. Kudlow, jump in here, because this is, we're zeroing in on a very important notion, obviously, particularly as we face QE2, the possibility of QE3 uh, on the Federal Reserve's part. We're, we'll get into taxation and spending, but, but what's your take on what Lewis is, the point well, Lewis is I basically made? agree with Lou. I mean, gee whiz. If you go back, let me just back up one moment from the prior panel. Growth. Growth solves a lot of problems. Okay. Growth solves budget problems, growth solves deficit problems, growth solves debt problems. Uh, I'm all for limiting spending. I just want to say that. Yes, yes, indeed. If we get back to 20% of GDP or less on spending, I am fine with that. Okay? Fine with that. But I don't see debt as this new red menace out there. What I see is growth as the Lord's savior to the economy and our fiscal position. Now, having said that, I'll come back to Lou's important points. I read his great article in the Weekly Standard, and I hope everybody read Steve Forbes' uh, editorial in the journal today. One of the things that I have learned in the last, I don't know, couple decades, three decades, lower marginal tax rates are essential to growth to restore incentives. But I have come to believe that lower marginal tax rates will not work and simply not work to their max unless we have stable money of the sort that Lou was talking about. In the 80s and 90s, the price of gold in fits and starts fell for 20 years, and the stock market boomed. And I don't think that was a coincidence. And if you take the low tax rate regime, and I know Clinton raised the top marginal tax rate in 93. He came to regret later. He did sign on to a capital gains tax cut later on. But I've always believed Clinton, for all his personal foibles, it was Reagan's third term. You know what I mean? We had a Republican Congress. It was Reagan's third term. I can live with that. And for whatever reason, whether it was a good Fed with Wayne Angel and Manley Johnson and Bob Heller and Greenspan, who in those days used to pay attention to the price of gold as a monetary signal. The 80s and 90s were a golden period of low marginal tax rates and pretty stable money. And the whole thing boomed. It just boomed. In fact, there's a piece circulating in the blogosphere by uh, Lewis Woodhill, Woodhall, a very clever chap, and he, he's with the Club for Growth. He measures the real Dow in gold terms. And the Dow Jones went up in relation to gold for 20 years. Since then, in the last 10, 11 years, it's gone down. That's bad, and I think that's what Lou is getting to. So for my money, 
I want low marginal tax rates and a sound dollar, a reliably sound dollar. You know, it's fascinating to me. They're actually starting to do this in the individual states. This is great. I know there's a taxpayer's revolution going on against big government spending and big government unions, which is great, but the states like Utah and other states, Virginia, whatever, they're actually talking about making uh, gold and silver legal tender. And that's probably the Federal Reserve's worst nightmare. Man, that's the beginning of a grassroots revolution towards sound money. Is that and realistic, I just, though? I just, well, I, you know, politically, I think it's just fabulous. It's just, you know, bubbling up from the bottom, bubbling up from the bottom. I mean, you've got my friend, he's still a friend, I hope, William Dudley, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I used to debate him all the time on the shows when he was the head economist of Goldman Sachs. He says the dollar doesn't matter. He says, don't worry about food prices. Don't worry about oil prices. Don't worry about gasoline prices because um, iPad prices are coming down. And he goes out to this place. <laughs> he, he, goes, he goes out and speaks to some kind of town hall meeting in Queens, New York. All right, Queens, Queens, good place. And he goes, he starts with this iPad stuff and people are screaming at him, I can't eat iPads. Right. I, I, can't put, I, I can't put iPads in my car. Right? I, I don't understand why we strip out food and energy right. with the CPI the pro, anyway. The pro, if, the goal, if the dollar were convertible into gold, and so far as Lou's point and Steve's point and Paul Jago's point and everybody else's point, the gasoline price would be a lot lower today. Okay? Oil prices would be a lot lower today. I wouldn't have to worry so much about whether Gaddafi is in or out or who his opponents are and all this stuff that I can't possibly understand. Just make the dollar sound and keep marginal tax rates low. The economy will grow beautifully. But if the dollar falls, as it's been falling for 10 years on the index, it's at a 10-year low nearly, then it neutralizes the lower tax rates. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because commodity prices soar and the capital flows outside the country and it's a dreadful policy. So low tax rates, limited government, keep the dollar sound. That's my take. Larry. Yep, uh, Maria, I'm sorry. I'm the, probably the only one here who's a member of the International Brotherhood of Central Bankers. Um, <laughs> and, I'm, and, 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 I'm, and I'm about to have my union, put my union card in jeopardy right. here. Yeah. Um, I agree with the predictions of the earlier panel and actually where, where both Lou and Larry are going, that uh, we will end this decade with um, something other than fiat money. Mm. Now, the, um, that said, I think we have to realize that gold standard is not free lunch either. And a look at history suggests that actually most societies alternate between fiat and specie money uh, depending on what their needs are. And they use one until it reaches its, the end of its usefulness, and then they switch to the other. Uh, the U.S. has switched back and forth four times in our short history. Uh, the Ming Dynasty did something similar. The advantage of paper is that it does make uh, credit more available, and in a period where you have very rapid technological change, uh, it's a very useful thing to have. Uh, gold is also abused. Gold prohibits the abuse, but doesn't allow the flexibility. And, you know, if you look back at the end of the 19th century, when we had the gold standard in place, what you had were very short business cycles, where you'd have a spike and then a quick collapse, and then a spike and then a quick collapse. You know, if you're building the railroads, and you've got to chop down all the forest, get the railroad ties together, you quickly run out of credit, and that tended to be what happened. Um, and Greenspan posited in the 90s, and although I disagreed with him on the, min agreed the, the FOMC minutes, I was very much against accommodating the 90s bubble. The case for elastic currency, when you have a positive technology shock, is pretty good, because you get the technology in place much more quickly when you have a long, elastically supplied business cycle, like we had in the 90s, um, to get technology in place, than when you have the short, sharp spikes that a gold standard would impose. So, you know, I just think we have to be, keep an open mind. I think they're going to be right. We're going to switch. Uh, central bankers aren't going to look too good in a few years. But 
I will guarantee you that we will not stay on a species-based standard forever either because it too has its drawbacks. But the trouble is that the last decade or so, under two Fed chairmen, two smart guys, and these are not personal attacks, believe me, um, Greenspan had a lot of gold instincts. He seemed to lose them in his last term. Ben Bernanke is a very smart guy. I mean, when he first came in, I was all for him because I knew, having served a prison term at Princeton years ago, <laughs> that, he, that he was only one of three non-socialists in the Princeton Economics Department. And I was very pleased with his appointment. But unfortunately, he's adopted a very, as Lou said, a very Keynesian stop and go. Look, the stop and go-ness is killing us. It's killing us. And we're in the midst of it right now. So I take the view. What do you mean stop and go? Pouring money in, then taking it out. Creating the bubble, then deflating the bubble. We're in this huge credit bubble right now, and you're seeing it in commodity prices, and Lord knows where else it's going to show up. Earlier uh, in the 2000s, we saw it in housing, then we saw it in commodities and energy. I think, Maria, we're seeing it in oil, too. I, I, I really think that the credit bubble has as much to do with it as anything going on in the Middle East, if you want to know the truth. And this is not good. There's no stability. And I, I go back to my model. In the 80s and 90s, by and large, the price of gold gradually came down from, in nominal terms, $800 an ounce to $250 an ounce in round numbers. And I don't know the, the exact right price of gold, but what I'm saying is, it showed a degree of monetary stability and discipline, which we are sorely lacking. The fact that gold has gone from $250 an ounce to $1,400 and change, in my view, cannot be a good thing and will not be a happy ending. Why? That's what is I'm the saying. ending? Where does this take us? The ending is going to be an inflation. The ending is going to be a lot of damage to consumers and corporations and profits. The ending is going to be a lot of damage to the dollar as the world's reserve currency, which um, may be from national pride, I would like to maintain, as long as it's linked to a solid currency, to gold, as, as Lou was suggesting. I don't want us to lose that privilege. I don't want us to lose that leadership. In fact, in fact, one can almost plot the rise of America as the gold price came down and the decline of America as the gold price went back up. These are not. Reagan knew this in the early economic meetings in 81 and early 82 and so forth. I was in some of those meetings. He talked about gold. He said a great, currency, a great country needs a great currency. He never flinched from gold. The reason he let Volcker do what Volcker was doing, wasn't perfect, but it was awfully strong at the time, he gave Volcker the, the, the ground to stand on, is because Reagan was steeped in the, in the virtues of the gold standard that uh, Lou was describing. And whatever the modern rendition is, I'm not against paper money. I'm not against paper money. I mm -hmm. just want it to have value. Right. And I'm saying the gold, the, the, the dollar problem is undermining the supply side argument of the efficacy and success of low marginal tax rates. I just want to make that point. The dollar problem is undermining the incentives and the efficacy and the success of, of supply-side tax cuts. If That's that is so, so obvious, why then do we have the policies that we have right now? Well, I, I, um, I'd like to respond to that while at the same time uh, uh, mentioning two points that uh, Larry uh, and one that uh, the other Larry uh, mentioned. We have the policies that we now have, especially if you're referring to runaway government spending and a runaway Federal Reserve System. And also a strong dollar policy in, in, in words, but not in action. Yes, well, uh, they're, but they're linked. So if you have a runaway Federal Reserve System, which is creating credit uh, in the amount, for example, if you take the Fed's balance sheet, which is published every Thursday night and it's available to everybody here, here in this room, if you look at the balance sheet three years ago and you look at today, you will find that we've added $1.7 trillion of new credit in the Federal Reserve balance sheet. The Federal Reserve's balance sheet, that is to say the supply of credit to the banking system at near zero interest rates, has tripled in a mere three years. Nothing of that sort with respect to any monetary base, whether it was gold or paper, has ever occurred in the in US history. So that, as a result, there, there are no restraints on the policymakers in Congress. Uh, both the Federal Reserve enables them with their zero interest rate 
to finance at the Federal Reserve System a government treasury in substantial deficit and a growing deficit, as well as foreign official uh, reserves, which themselves are invested in the treasury. And that brings me to um, uh, Larry's point that we are, we are undermining the marginal tax rate revolution engineered successfully by Reagan and maintained really until this very day uh, with a threat on the horizon in 2012, but at the moment uh, uh, we're okay. It reminds me of the story the man who jumps out of the window and on uh, the 10th story and at the eight, uh, he's gone down eight floors and he says everything is all right. Well, 2012 uh, is, is approaching. And there, surely, the marginal tax rate revolution uh, is, is threatened. So how do we get, in Larry's uh, phrase, a stable dollar so that the marginal tax rate re uh, revolution will enable all Americans to have the kind of equal opportunity in advance? And the way we can, uh, there is a tested way. Uh, and the entire Industrial Revolution, uh, uh, my friend Larry Lindsay's uh, 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 comments to the contrary notwithstanding. The entire Industrial Revolution, the greatest period in American economic growth, where the population expanded at a rate uh, unparalleled, the gyroscope of that was monetary convertibility. Uh, whether the price level rose slightly uh, from 1800 until 1914, or whether the price level fell slightly, generally at about one and a half to two percent uh, on either side, that is to say up or down, the economic growth in that period was unparalleled. It raised humanity out of, all of humanity in the developed world out of, out of poverty. And the mechanism, the monetary mechanism, was the gold standard. So I would argue, Larry, that the gold standard does provide for elasticity. It provides for a, credit, a very sophisticated credit system. It also provides for paper money. But the elasticity is not infinite as it is today with the present Federal Reserve System. There is a limitation on aspiring congressmen who wish to feed certain either welfare constituencies, war constituencies, or other constituencies with special uh, subsidies. And in addition, we can be sure that um, Larry's last metaphor, which is it doesn't last forever, um, I don't think we should be making monetary policy with a horizon of forever. We need to think in terms of generations. I guess it was Bismarck who said, we have to leave some problems to be solved by our grandchildren. So mon monetary convertibility, what it does, it puts a restraint, a restraint on the Federal Reserve System. Because when the Federal Reserve creates too much money, excess money, that the people at home or abroad don't wish to hold, they can redeem, they can redeem it for gold at a statutory fixed rate. I get your point about limitless, but would we have seen the improvement, slight or moderate, you know, as they have been, that's debatable, in the economic recovery thus far in the last two years, let's go a little more short term, had it not been for the Fed's policies? Well, I don't know, I just wrote a little column uh, this is the weakest growing recovery. This is the softest recovery. I mean, coming out of the disaster, we ought to be growing 7 8%, really. And I fear that right now, like the first quarter, we've had some jolts from gasoline prices and Japanese uh, disaster of the supply chain. But for whatever reason, uh, I'm worried we'll be under 3% for the fourth consecutive quarter. And it really ain't much of a recovery in that respect. You know me, Maria, I'm a much better bull than a bear. I want to be as optimistic as possible. It's in my nature. Do you think we'll be here in 2012? Well, I, you know, the, the policy is big government no. spending and easy money. This troubles me. Big government spending, that itself is a tax hike on the economy. And easy money is going to turn into an inflation tax hike. This ain't good. The, the, the Mundell prescription, the Laffer Mundell idea, was low marginal tax rates and sound money. We got the reverse now. And, and even, I, she, I don't know who, somebody wrote this, but that even extending the Bush tax cuts, which I heartily approve, heartily approve, looked like it was going to actually come in. You know, people got pretty bullish in the December and January on the economy. Now, all of a sudden, with the dollar falling like it is and gasoline prices rising like it is, which, again, I think has more to do with our dollar than, uh, than Libya, uh, the economy is not going to have this, the bounce that we hoped it would from 
from low tax rates. And, and I want to inject one other thing in here before we lose it. Regulations, regulations. Um, it really was one of Reagan's pillars of uh, wisdom in terms of the economy. And under Democratic and Republican leadership, we are heaping regulations onto this economy. Uh, a very good article, a very good editorial in the journal this morning on Sarbox and IPOs. I fully agree, but I think it's just attitude. And at the tip of that iceberg is the single greatest regulatory mistake this country could ever make, and that is Obamacare. I mean, the sheer tax, regulatory, paperwork, central government, command and control nature of Obamacare. It is such a growth stifler, it is beyond belief. How many people in the room agree with that? Continue on. No, I, uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm giving you anything you haven't heard before. I, I'm just I'm saying. I just to make sure we were all on the same page. Uh, <laughs> that, thing's, you know, that thing was passed about a year ago. I, I, I did my best. You know, you and I have a lot of reporting to do during the day, and we can't always focus on one single item. I've done my best to understand Obamacare. I'm still learning about Obamacare, what the hell's in there. And I, the more I learn, the more staggered I get. I mean, this was the most evil, genius, malevolent idea I have ever seen. It's just re And not remarkable. to take us too far into that conversation, but now but how we many companies are actually regulations. exempt from, I mean, it's just... Well, that's, but, that's, but that's the point, Larry. There's a, I, it's, if there's it's, a thousand it's, waivers... It, if it's, there's a thousand, thousand waivers, then, waivers, then let's right. have it all waived. Right. Let's just waive the entire yeah. bill. That's what I yeah. would do. Go ahead, Larry Lindsay. You know, one should never exaggerate the intelligence of government. <laughs> and and you're, you're implying that there was malevolence in planning. Yeah. This was, simply, <laughs> this was simply a case of gross incompetence. Remember, this, the Senate passed the bill the day before Christmas break. And there were at least 10 Democratic senators who voted for it, who got up and said, this is a lousy bill. It's not going to work. I'm going to vote for it to move the process forward. But what they were thinking was the House would then pass a bill. It would then be worked out in conference. Brown won. The House then had to pass the bill that even the senators who voted for it agreed was incompetent. We are now living that incompetence. Everyone knows it doesn't work. Secretary Sebelius is stitching it together by issuing uh, waivers at the rate of about 10 a week, um, maybe higher. Uh, this is going to be continuing. The problem in Washington now is that if it's called Obamacare, you can't change it as long as Obama is on the ticket. And so the administration knows they have an unworkable plan in place, but they can't admit that until after uh, November 2012. We will be reforming Obamacare in 2013 because it will not work unless maybe the Supreme Court takes us out of our misery now. Yeah, that's a great point. And my, my good friend Lou, I just want to, I agree the incentives for Congress to spend appear to be much greater when interest rates are zero. I wish that were true. They spent plenty when interest rates were 21.5%. Interest rates are not a constraint on the behavior of government. It would be great if they were, because any constraint on the government would be, would be fine. So I don't think we're going to get a lot um, um, of, of governmental change uh, by making the reform, although I agree with you, in the end, it's going to change. The bigger concern now is if we switch to a gold standard or any other monetary tightening, if you look at the balance sheet of the federal government, with the size of the debt we now have, every extra basis point of borrowing cost is a huge figure. By the end of the decade, we'll be 25 trillion in debt, which means every single basis point is going to be costing you on the order of uh, two and a half billion, 250 billion a percentage point the average borrowing cost uh, in the last two decades, which was a low inflation period, was 5.7. We're now borrowing at 2.2. If we add 350 basis points to what we are now doing on that borrowing cost, we're going to be adding a trillion just in interest expense. You can't cut spending enough in, and face that higher interest expense. So we are now in a debt trap 
that until we get control of the fiscal process first, we are not able to have a significant increase in interest rates. It's a sad position to be in, but we've got to do fiscal first and monetary second. Let me, let me go back to something uh, Kudlow said, and that was growth solves, solves all problems. And getting to growth, we're talking about taxation and, and a change in, in tax rates. Um, putting the Fed aside for a moment, what is the appropriate rate? I mean, you know, Steve Forbes in his wonderful op-ed this morning uh, talked about a, a good tax uh, policy and then all of the things stripping away uh, added things for companies and uh, sort of created a, a, a bad situation. So what is the appropriate tax rate, Larry? Because with populism out there saying the income gap is the issue and it's not fair, how do you make the argument for lower tax rates today? Well, I think it's fundamentally a growth and simplicity argument, just like it always was. And I think the rate structure, by the way, the middle, particularly the middle class rate structure is just way too high. I mean, I don't think people making 50, 60, 70 grand a year or a family I don't know, in New York or Minneapolis or Atlanta or San Francisco, you know, the husband might be a senior cop and the wife might be a senior teacher. They're Particularly making, when food and energy is where they are. Right, they're there. making 200 grand a year together or so close to it. I don't think that the middle class should have to pay 25 and 28 percent marginal tax rates. I, I think it should be 15 percent. I mean, look, Reagan left the code at 28 and 15. It wasn't perfect, that's a pretty good reference point. Steve Forbes and Art Laffer and others believe you can flatten that tax rate down to under 20%. And I think that is an experiment worth, you know, worth trying. Right now, what troubles me the most is the high marginal tax rates on business, on business, including what inflation is going to do to the depreciation schedules. Uh, are corporations paying the highest tax rate in the world or tied with Japan or whatever? I guess Japan is going to lower it. The, um, the S-Corps have to pay the 35 to 40 percent. That's too high. We mean business tax overhaul is so important for competitiveness and, and capital investment purposes, you know, talking about building up the capital stock. Like Which our, then spawned a whole innovation era right. um, I mean, we're in not, Silicon Valley. You know, it's great. We, we like to cover on the air that, you know, mergers and acquisitions, I guess, are good for the stock market. The problem I have with that is, I'm not against mergers and acquisitions, it's a market function. I want to see new business creation. Unless the mergers are forced, then it's not yeah, so good. Yeah, but I mean, I, I want to see the new ones coming up, yeah. and I'm not seeing enough new ones. There are some, but not enough. That's the, that's the growth experiment, to, to use Larry's book. And um, the, the, the tax system is a, is, a, is, a, is a bloody mess. And incidentally, I, just on Obamacare, you know, I got to be in my bonnet on that, but <laughs> The tax burdens in Obamacare are enormous. Let us not forget that. Mm. They're going to raise the payroll tax and apply that for the first time in tax history to investment taxes. So we are going to have a huge qualitative and quantitative increase in the marginal tax rates on the extra dollar put at risk in investment just to finance this wacko system that is going to have all these new entitlements that's not only going to stifle economic growth, it's going to make the budget even more bankrupt than it was before. Yeah. It's not Larry, a good deal. It is malevolent. It is malevolent. Larry, you know why it's jump, malevolent? Jump here. It's malevolent because to get it passed, the corrupt government had to buy off individual senators. They bought them off. That's malevolence. Larry. It wasn't just stupidity. It was malevolence. They knew yeah. what they were doing. They well, bought off Mo Manjo. They bought ideology. off Ben Nelson. That is third world corruption is what that is. You, it was an ideology. <laughs> Lou, I want to get your take on taxation, but Larry, you've thought and written a lot about this. Give us your take on this. I want to get the audience involved. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. On taxation. Your thoughts. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the growth experiment, which Larry Moan and the Manhattan Institute sponsored, and I I thank you very much for that. Which they're, I they're, reviewed. And which you reviewed, absolutely. The, um, Positively. Uh, I think in the end, we are going to have to have fundamental reform. You know, actually, the tax code is a lot like Obamacare. You have, you have it administered through a series of waivers. Now, we call them deductions You're or right. we call yeah, them tax expenditures. Analogy, yeah. 
but that's really what they are. They're given to the politically powerful. Um, I was on a bipartisan panel in front of the Senate Budget Committee. Um, so this is a mostly Democratic committee. And the panel, you know, I was definitely the most conservative person on it. Um, we all agreed that in the end, we're going to be moving out away from income-based taxation. Because income is an opinion, cash is a fact. And we have to move to a cash-based tax. Uh, it's the only way out. Uh, it can be a flat rate tax. It can be a value-added tax. But we have to have that be a replacement for what we now have, because the amount of meddling that can happen by the politicians in an income-based tax system is just too great. Lou? Well, you started you off talking about the Fed and the issue there. Where are you on taxation? Um, single tax rate. Uh, the single tax rate, which will require us at, at that low level to eliminate uh, both on the left uh, subsidies for um, their uh, pet projects, whether they be malevolent or incompetent, and, and, and on the right for those subsidies which are identifiable uh, in the business uh, sector. And, uh, there's a litany uh, uh, for each of them, and I, and I won't go into that. But uh, we need a single tax rate, uh, or at least close to a single tax rate, which, of course, President Reagan aimed at, which takes into account the scale of the tax base itself. So if we can enlarge the tax base uh, without uh, a de uh, decreasing incentives and apply a single tax rate, it will be the most fundamental reform that, at the margin, escaped uh, uh, President Reagan. Even so, I would, uh, if I may, on this uh, point which uh, Larry uh, Kudlow was dwelling on, Obamacare um, is where it is at um, in a position for limitless financing because the limitless credit is available to the federal government to finance it. So again, with all respect for my, my friend Larry Lindsay, uh, uh, in his last comment that about we must get fiscal control, my argument is we shall never get fiscal control. That, is, that any sensible man or woman would embrace, such as budgetary equilibrium over the full business cycle, until we get the monetary system, that is to say the Federal Reserve System, and its unrestrained credit policies uh, under control. Now, we can debate uh, long and hard about what is the best mechanism to do that. In my opinion, uh, viewing uh, the only laboratory which human beings have available to them, the laboratory of human history, um, the gold standard, was the least imperfect monetary system available to restrain politicians who have their own interests from spending the people's money beyond uh, the capacity of the economy to absorb these expenditures. It's one of the reasons why I do dwell now, since Reagan accomplished so much, and so much of it has been lost in the last 20 years, I do dwell on what I think President Reagan himself might have been called the MacGuffin. Do you remember Alfred Hitchcock's movies where there was always a secret uh, solution to the problem and it was referred to as the MacGuffin? If you could get at the MacGuffin, you could solve this entire mysterious problem. In this particular case, limitless government spending and the growth of the federal government when everybody is pledged, like Phil Graham and many others, to ending it by statute. Well, the MacGuffin here, I believe, is uh, the monetary reform for it will apply uh, f uh, a necessary fiscal uh, constraint. And with economic growth, rapid economic growth, based upon Larry Kudlow's uh, proposition, we can grow into a steady level of spending, which has been restrained by the limitation of Federal Reserve credit and foreign official dollar reserves. We have three microphones uh, that, that will be roaming the audience. So I want to, uh, if you have a question, please, please raise your hand. But, but while we do that, let me throw one thing at you guys. I don't know if you heard recently Michael Moore's comment. It's our money and we want it back. What is the pushback? <laughs> that's what he said. I mean, Michael I'm sure Moore? everybody saw Actually, this Actually, that's the best craziness. thing I've heard from that's him. That's what he said. No, no, no. No, but. <laughs> Talking no. about business oh. and yes. uh, highest earners should pay more. People's money. So what is the pushback, <laughs> Larry and Larry and Lou, for this idea that higher earners, 
corporations make a lot of money and they should carry more of the burden. Well, listen, the, uh, whether it's the federal government or the states, the big states particularly, you know, the high earners are paying about 40 percent of the income taxes at lower tax rates, at least at the federal government. And uh, I don't know how much you want them to pay. I mean, even here in New York, it's fascinating to me, uh, our new Democratic governor, Andrew Cuomo, will not reimpose the so-called millionaire's tax, which I don't think starts at a million, was it, about 500,000 or yeah. 250, right. whatever. But he won't even do it. I mean, they're already paying as much as they can pay before they move to foreign uh, countries where the tax rates are even lower. Or not everyone in America can live in Florida. Larry Lindsay? I would love to have an election come on up here. based We've got a lot of on questions here. that single issue. Yeah. You ask the American people, is the money you earn yours or the government's? Right. Vote. Let's, let's have an election. Yeah. And um, I guarantee you the, the public knows very well that folks who earn their money, it's not the government who beneficently gives it to them. Questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Economic Research Foundation. Uh, I'm wondering, given the political difficulty that, it might, uh, that might, we might encounter, if we wanted to have a flat tax and people would say, well, I actually like my mortgage deduction, I like my charitable deduction, uh, might the answer be to have a voluntary flat tax and let people choose to have a 15% or 17% flat tax, but if you like all your deductions and your write-offs, you can do that and let people just have a choice either of the existing tax code or a flat tax instead? Uh, well, that, uh, I think the question is an excellent one. That is what the issue uh, at quadrennial intervals is in presidential elections. Uh, one hopes that one candidate will present a coherent program for one of the alternatives that you uh, specify. Another candidate will uh, campaign for the presidency um, on one of the other uh, two options. It is very difficult to put on a ballot a, a choice in a national election of that sort. Though it's not uh, unthinkable, it, um, it might be unintelligible. And uh, so therefore, we have to pray that our presidential elections turn into the kinds of campaigns that President Reagan introduced in 1980, when the contrast with the preceding president's uh, program was distinct, obvious, and transparent to almost all, all the voters. And while Reagan was uh, held to be an underdog up until the very uh, moment of his election. I think he was described by the New York Times as a troglodyte. Um, nevertheless, the American people recognized the differences in the programs and embraced uh, Reagan. And of course, uh, uh, we all know the results. So I, I would look to presidential elections to establish the programs on which the American voters would um, uh, v vote yay or nay. And then I would look to that president hopefully a man of principle and a program that he wishes to execute to carry it out. At any April 15th, people could choose one or the other. The, the choice always would be there available, available to each taxpayer every year, as opposed to having one choice or the other through an election. That's the difference I mean. I, I, know I would like to defer to my friends, but just logistically, I find that um, uh, something we, we could contemplate, but very, very difficult to do. Let's get another question in here. Yes, sir. Yes, John Burlaw, Competitive Enterprise Institute. I wanted to get to uh, Larry's point about Starbucks constraining the growth of new businesses and, and your point, Maria, about uh, the uh, Silicon Valley innovation in the 80s. I think one striking contrast between the 80s and now is Home Depot went public with only four stores. And it, it was a four-store chain when it went public. And now you have, uh, in the post-Starbucks era, Google goes public with a billion market cap, and Facebook still hasn't gone public when it may still have a hundred uh, uh, billion market cap. So it seemed like in the 80s, companies actually went public to raise seed money, whereas now it's, it's sort of when they finally do go public to, um, uh, uh, to, real, uh, to realize value for, uh, for, for some, of their, some of their owners. It's not, it's, what impact do you think the difficulties of smaller companies going public is having on growth in the economy compared to some of the other things like, uh, like monetary policy and tax policy? And also, is there a way to uh, 
make the uh, bipartisan th things like Sarbacca reform again in Dodd Frank in the one slightly deregulatory uh, measure in Dodd Frank was a, an exemption uh, from Sarbacca's internal the internal control auditing mandates for the very smallest public companies. You know one. Uh, <clears throat> One of the troubles in the current environment for going public or things of that sort, man, you make one bad phone call, you can go to jail for 50 years. That can't be good. That can't be good. And I'm all for punishing crooks, don't get me wrong. But there is so much emphasis on enforcement and rulemaking and so little emphasis on entrepreneurship that the, 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 the Seesaw has just gotten out of line. It just has gotten out of line. And this Facebook story is so interesting to me because uh, I mean, we covered it so heavily. You, you know, mean a market being created for Facebook being a private company? Right. They, they, there seemed, I mean, I guess eventually they'll go public, although I don't, I don't know that, but they worked so hard to raise capital without going public. Right, and, and they did it. And they did it. And, and, uh, and I think one reason for that was all these rules and regulations. You know, I think, uh, I think that's a big part of it. It ought to be easy and desirable to raise capital in the public market so everybody can participate, rather than have these covert financings and relying on one firm to be the whole clearinghouse. That troubles me a little bit. Well, is part of the issue, though, that the people in government who are so-called policing the industry um, are not equipped to necessarily understand the complexities happening in business? Yes. Yes, that's the fundamental problem. Uh, um, a very brief study was done um, um, of all the presidential administrations since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the cabinet officers and the senior officers of each of the presidential administrations since 1900 was examined. Um, on average, I believe that approximately 70 to 80 percent of the senior officers of an administration had been themselves involved in the market economy in a vocation that had to do with getting and spending or um, um, an advocate, an advocate's position with respect to uh, doing business, establishing businesses, or originating businesses, or managing businesses. Then the uh, same research was applied to uh, the Obama administration. The number was 5%. We have an administration, I'm, I'm sure, uh, full of well-intentioned men. I'm here uh, to assail no man's motives. Uh, full of um, men and women with uh, good intentions. But they are not only incompetent by Larry Lizzie's standards, but they are, I think your adjective was, they are ill-equipped. They are not equipped at all to deal with a, a, a business system um, of, on the scale of the United States of America, which has historically, from its very inception, been decentralized and not governed by a command and a control economy filled with men who were inspired um, in their university systems by uh, pseudo-socialism. I'm not sure that we, we answered your question, uh, but yes, sir. Microphone's coming. Just talk about growth and uh, with the globalization and it appears to be the exploitation of American jobs, where is this growth going to come from? Where is it going to come from? Re repeat the question. You mean what sectors or? Well, where are the jobs going to come from? We seem to be, globalization is creating exploitation of jobs. It's cheaper overseas. Even, even with these iPods, it's being produced overseas. So even with innovation, I, I, my question is, where are the jobs going to come from? Where, where are the jobs going to come from? Where is the innovation going to come from? Particularly, by the way, as America doesn't have a lock on innovation right now. You know, right, right now you're seeing the Russians uh, create their own Silicon Valley and the Chinese making uh, solar panels. So where, do, where are the jobs going to come from and the innovation? Look, we, we have so many people unemployed and, and the participation rate of employment is so low right now that, that we need to get those people back into the workforce. We need to create the opportunities to get them back into the workforce. And for a variety of reasons, 
Businesses, large, medium, and small, are reluctant to take a risk on the marginal worker right now because they think it may be too expensive. Regulatory, tax. And bureaucratic, right? Or the yeah, or the future economies, you know, the economic outlook. I mean, one area that occurs to me where we could have a major boom in a high-tech industry is energy, is energy. But I don't want to just pick out a couple of aspects of energy. I want the whole American energy sector Take the shackles off. Take the handcuffs off. Let them rip. Um, I was so jealous when you interviewed Rex Tillerson. It was a great interview. He's my favorite CEO. And it was one of these wonderful Maria-type interviews. This guy wants to go to work. He wants to go to work. Let him. Look what they've done. And let all those oil companies and all those gas companies and all those refining companies. And let's fix the nuclear city. If there are things to improve on nuclear, let's do that. Let's go to clean coal. And let's go to alternative fuels, too. But let the marketplace do it. In other words, unshackle the American energy business. It is one of our greatest businesses. You know, you're talking about the emergence of the industrial age and how we brought the whole world forward, and you're dead right. Look at the role energy played in that. It was phenomenal. We've been talking about innovation in energy for a long time, right. Larry, haven't we? And it hasn't yeah. taken hold. It's just these guys, want, they're afraid. They're afraid of their own shadow. You know, they'd rather drill off West Africa than, than do something for the United States. There's one area right there. The other was transportation, another manufacturing industry. My friend uh, Fred Smith, the CEO of FedEx, if there's a better businessman, I don't know who it could be. Fred Smith says, Quit regulating me to death and quit taxing me to death. Now, this guy created, I don't know how many jobs he created, 50,000 jobs, whatever, worldwide. Give me 100% write-offs for new investment. Give me a low marginal tax rate. Listen to um, the former CEO of Intel, Otolini. He says, I don't need to go to, I, we don't have to go to China. I've heard Jim El, J, uh, Jeff Immelt say this. Of GE. He says, I don't want to go to China. They're not that good. Chinese workers aren't that good. By the way, it ain't that cheap anymore. Make it good, make it competitive for me at home. Quit taxing me at home. Quit now, regulating me at I home. I would say putting Obamacare aside, there is innovation happening in health care oh, as a result of technology. So th there's a shot private, that there's real innovation in biotech Private health care is one of the greatest employers of this yes. country. In fact, the private health care sector during this whole jobs downturn has been a net creator of jobs. The private health care, yeah, you're, exactly you. right. yeah. you're exactly let's, right. You're exactly right. Let's try to get some more questions in here. Uh, that, these are all the areas where we can grow the economy. Jump in, Lou, because I want to get your take on this. Here's this question right here. What are the prospects of reestablishing a growth agenda, do you think, uh, when approximately half of the population uh, are net recipients of transfer payments from, from the government? If I understood the question, what are the prospects of uh, what are the prospects for growth in our country, given the well, given the vested political interest in roughly half the population of maintaining net payments from as opposed to the to the government? I believe all heard the question. Uh, given the vested political interests which have erected these barriers to which both Larrys have uh, referred in their in their previous comments. It is a very demanding prospect compared to the, the, those moments in the uh, growth of America when the federal government absorbed only 10% of uh, national output as opposed to what it's now going to, uh, it, it's certainly rising toward 30%. Still, um, there is no more innovative uh, country than the United States of, of America. Even with Sarbanes-Oxley, to get uh, this gentleman's question. Sarbanes-Oxley is having the tendency to cause a young developing companies, one I'm associated with, which is very profitable, which could go public, but has spent all the money to, be, to qualify for Sar Sarbanes-Oxley. They're staying private, but they are finding the financing that they need in order to grow just as rapidly, I believe, as they would otherwise in, in a public market. So that the American people, so long as they're not, sh not completely shut down by some kind of um, a total command and control system are going to be the great innovators uh, uh, in economic activity, even with the vested interests uh, in politicians. Is it harder? Yes. 
Uh, are there people who are prepared to meet the challenge just the way our parents or grandparents did? I, I'm absolutely uh, certain of that. Uh, are there those who are going to um, um, play in an economy which has become uh, increasingly uh, the, the winner take all? Uh, yes, and I think that's one of the problems. What we have in an inflationary economy, which has expressed itself, as Maria was just saying, primarily in food and energy, we have uh, inflation affecting middle income and lower income people. Uh, in, in fact, forcing a, a, a vast sector of the population uh, from near subsistence, as it were, to fears of even uh, starvation. And you have another segment of the population, which nimble speculators, nimble investors, and entrepreneurial business builders who are, in fact, able to accommodate themselves to this inflationary process. And so what the inflation does, what the unrestrained Federal Reserve does, it creates invisibly increasing social inequality, which itself plays into the congressional scene and gives congressmen on the left in the Obama administration all the writ that they need to insist upon a command and control economy to equalize the wealth. So, and, and that's playing into politics. We have yeah. about a, a minute or two left because we have a reception to get, but I just want to get your take, all three of you, on where this is going. What is the proper economic policy that the GOP needs to come up with to compete with Obama in 2012, and will that resonate with the American people? Larry Linzo, Lindsay, c kick us off here. The right economic policy for the next candidate to present? Well, <clears throat> I think that the congressional elections next year are far more important than the presidential election. And it goes to the previous question. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, and anyone who wants to look at the detailed polling numbers can see it, the reason the Republicans won in 2010 was seniors trended from Dem to Republican. She is going to try and flip them back. When the um, uh, President's Commission, Fiscal Reform Commission, uh, uh, came out, they had a very progressive Social Security plan. She immediately attacked it. She is going to make the issue, we are not going to cut your entitlements. Mm -hmm. Senator Reid has said, Social Security is not in trouble for 20 years, let's deal with it then. It is a very logical political position. That is going to be the attack. If the Congress goes Democratic in 2012, we will not have entitlement reform, and we will be validating your point, and we're washed up. Um, if, on the other hand, that attack does not succeed, you will have a mandate for entitlement reform that either President Obama or a Republican will be happy to embrace. So I would focus very hard on the 2012 congressional races because I think that's going to determine the future. Larry. Well, I tend to have an optimistic view of this. I really like what I saw in 2010. And I love what the Tea Party has done. I call it free market populism. And I think it really infused the GOP. But I also think it sent a message to a lot of moderate Democrats. So I think the whole political game has shifted to the right and is, is good. What remains to be seen is whether the Republicans can produce a candidate through the ele uh, primary process who has a true economic growth agenda and deals with some of the things we've been talking about. On this like panel. Paul Ryan's agenda? Well, yeah, I don't want to single out. Yes, look, my, we need flat tax reform, we need spending limitations. We need the dollar as sound, as good as gold. We need deregulation. We need free trade. It's a Reagan-esque message, and it needs to be adopted to the current modern situation. Nothing is ever the same. The 80s were, you know, 80 was different than 2012. But we need a growth message. I, I actually think that in the Republican House, I think John Boehner, in my conversations with him, he's a growth guy. I think Eric Cantor is a growth guy. I think Ryan is a growth guy. They're not the enemies. I think that the, the crop of governors running and so forth, I think it's a pretty good bench, good crop. I think that you know, people like this in this group and elsewhere need to push them and push them and push them towards a growth message. At the end of the day, 
All this fiscal reform, all this monetary reform, all this tax reform should, should be aimed to underwrite, really, I, I stay with this, a 5% economic growth target. That's what John F. Kennedy had in the early 60s when he unveiled his tax reform. We need to say to people, these big government command uh, uh, policies did work. We're going to show you a different way with private initiative and sound money. We're going to get rid of this inflation, and we want to get the unemployment rate back to 4%. We want to get the economy growing at 5% for a bunch of years. And oh, by the way, that's going to solve a lot of problems. I think the growth message is the single most important message the GOP has to produce in this uh, Very in well this said, election. Larry. Lou, final, final thoughts here. Well, I, I, of course, embrace uh, Larry's um, economic policy. And I think that a Republican president following it, or candidate following it, uh, would do very well indeed. I think we have to be very self-conscious about uh, recruiting in the presidential campaign uh, Democrats, Democrats from all walks of life. Uh, in order to do this, I, I think it, it, it's important to grasp that the single most important factor that produces uh, employment growth, job growth, uh, if, you, if you scrub all of the statistics, you will find that the, the growth rate in the use of energy is the single most important factor in producing an increase in jobs on a secular basis. So I believe that um, a presidential candidate embracing uh, the program, as Larry spelled out, is also going to have to deal with the issue of how do we cause the total volume of energy which we can apply to our economy in our homes, in our businesses, in our factories, in, in creating new mines, which are very energy intensive. Farming, which is one of the most energy intensive businesses in the world, and we are the best at it. How can we increase the supply of energy faster than the demand for it, such that the costs fall and the poverty which middle income and lower income Democrats are suffering, they can see that the inflation rate that they are enduring is going to fall. So I think the energy question has to be taken head on mm. by a Republican presidential candidate in addition, great, to, great in addition to the Reagan program. It's a great it's a point, great and thought. certainly uh, bringing up great farming thought. is also. Lou Lehrman, Larry Kudlow, Larry Lindsay, thank you, everyone, thank you. Please join us for the reception next tour. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.